Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Friday, April 1st, 2022. I'm Maggie Lake here with Rao Powell, co-founder and CEO of Real Vision. And it's not an April Fool's joke. He's really here with us. Hi, Rao. Great to see you, Maggie. It's great to see you, too. And I'm so glad that we get a chance to talk today because we're going to be together in California next week for Real Vision's macro experience where we're getting together all the all-star guests and friends of show and your heavy hitter friends um, to really try to sort of suss out what's going on. And I, I think it's a perfect time because we just wrapped the first quarter and you could just see in the market action today, there's really nothing going on. Everything's kind of flat and sideways because it feels like people are weighing some really big questions. What's happening with inflation? What does that mean for interest rates? Are we going into recession? So let's just kick off uh, and, and talk to us about the thesis you're working off of. Where's your head right now? Well, my head remains with my core framework, which has been we are still in a disinflationary world and that interest rate rises are self-limiting because everybody's too indebted and the aging population and that trend in bond yields, I call the chart of truth, where bond yields go down over time, holds. That is currently the least popular view from most people. <laughs> everybody, it's and I've interviewed Everybody that I know and really respect, you know, I just, just did an interview with James Aitken, Gerard Minak, um, Kirill Sokolov, they've all changed their macro view. They're like, structurally, we think there's long-term inflation. And their view is, we think there's long-term inflation because of the amount of spending that will happen to transition to ESG, and that's there's not enough commodities to deal with that. Absolutely true that supply chains are coming back to regionalized, so people need to build new factories. And I think that's true too. Um, I still think that the demographic story is larger and that demand for commodities is driven by um, the economy itself. And so I know it's fiscal stimulus, but at the margin, if households spend less, then the, the price of commodities comes lower I think overall, I still think commodities come lower than here. The big question for me, I, th I think we're headed towards recession. Now, again, as ever, everyone's saying, well, this time it's different. The, forwards, the forward part of the twos curve doesn't suggest interest rate cuts. The three-month, 10-year is not inverted. You know, there's always a, but this time. I generally look at all the forward-looking indicators that I've been using for the last 20 years. Most of them are weakening, showing weakening growth. I don't have many things that give me a recession yet. So it kind of feels like 2006, where the yield curve remained inverted for a period of time uh, before the actual bad news comes. And it's interesting because today you saw a, real, a robust jobs number, right? Over 400,000, you've got the unemployment rate. You do have things that are indicating that the economy looks strong, but they are a bit rear view mirror, right? So yeah, what, what are you seeing, right? What are you seeing that, or what leads you to believe that we are gonna go go into, or, or at least growth is gonna weaken substantially if it's not an outright recession? Is it just the natural course of the economy? Has it been happening already? Or is it because of the Federal Reserve? No, it's happened because of commodity prices. What we've had is a massive tightening of monetary conditions because wages have gone up 5% and inflation has gone up seven and a half. So what you've done is destroyed demand by 2.5%. So that basically, if the, if the trend rate of growth is 2.5%, you've just gone to zero. So I see that in inventories to new orders in ISM. Um, that relationship suggests that the economy is headed to pretty close to recession. I look at um, shipping, freight, all of these indicators, the year-on-year -year rate of change, they've all gone to recessionary levels. So something's going on. Consumer sentiment, the University of Michigan's consumer sentiment indicator is recession levels. It's consistent with the yield curve. Uh, small business optimism, falling not yet at recession levels. Um, ISM um, new orders, falling not yet at recession levels. Um, the ECRI year-on-year -year survey, the Econ Economic uh, Research Cycles Institute, um, that is, again, pretty low, near zero. So there's a lot of indicators that are like, 
Listen, ISM is likely to get down to between 52 and 50 between June, July, something like that. Usually the Fed stops when that happens. Yeah, well, well you know, but everything we hear from the Fed right now, uh, they are very hawkish. I yeah. mean, they, ha you know, they, they, uh, obviously they're catching up, but uh, 50 basis points, that's every, even the ones before that sounded dovish. So yeah. certainly they're going to try in the beginning, but you don't think they'll get nearly as far along as they'd like to. I don't think so, because I think demand has been destroyed already. And, you know, mortgage rates have gone up a lot. We're seeing housing market cooling down. So all the things you'd expect to see are happening. So, you know, I think the moment, um, you know, oil's has been coming off and it's still kind of a bit sideways ish, but it, if it bro breaks much lower than, let's say, 95, it could go back down to 80. And that takes a lot of pressure off. You know, wheat as well. I did the, the, the work on the stocks to use ratio of wheat, excluding China's massive stock of wheat. It's still pretty high. It's as high as it's been in the last 20 years. So, we, as long as we don't have a terrible harvest in wheat, we're not going to run out of food. So, I think that the market might have overextrapolated the trend. And I think that if the ISM comes down to somewhere close to 50 by the summer, the Fed might have done another 50 basis points or 75 basis points. But they're going to say, well, let's just watch and wait and see. Now, we saw this playbook in 2016. The Fed were like, yep, we're going to raise rates four times this year. They raised once and then didn't do anything for over a year. So let's wait and see. I think because the yield curve is later in the cycle, um, unlike 2016, I don't think they come back again and start raising. If they stop, they stop. You know, you said you've been, you've been, uh, you're uh, maybe the contrarian on this now, and you've t been talking to your friends, and they've been making uh, on Real Vision really compelling arguments. And some of them have given up views they've held with you for, for something like 20 years, right? And I just listened to the Jarred interview, actually, and it was it was so good. Um, and I want to run a clip from that um, right at the top, because I think he's really speaking to this this sort of debate that's going on in the market, because you talk, he talked about why he's changed his view and why he thinks the market has it wrong about rates. Let's have a listen to that. As we came out of the GFC, the market was saying, you know what, uh, the long run real Fed fund rate can be two to two and a half percent positive. And that was what they were also pricing prior to the GFC. So no change. Despite the, the depth of the downturn, we were going to go back to a world where ultimately the, the neutral rate of interest was over two percent real. Uh, and we would have positive real rates on average through, through the cycle. It was only when you had the euro crisis and austerity in the US that the, the near-term rate expectations collapsed and people moved to uh, assuming lower for longer. But even then, they were expecting that we'd go back to real positive rates in the long run. Last two years, that real long run Fed expectation has turned negative. So we have markets now that are no longer pricing lower for longer, they're pricing lower forever. We never get out of this. We, we always have negative real rates. Uh, once again, it's, it's the resilience of the view that nothing has changed. And I just think that's a mistake. I think the world has changed. And that's not to say that we're going to get necessarily higher inflation. It's to say that the interest rate required to have a normal inflation rate is now higher than it was post GFC. And the peak in rates this cycle is going to be higher than what the market expects. And the, the world has changed. Uh, but the market so far, I've got to say, doesn't agree with me. And that full interview is available to Essential Plus and pro members on realvision.com. It's so good, Raul. And it's so interesting because I think this is what's so difficult for people right now. Is there really compelling arguments on both sides of this? Well, because we're living through a structural change of which none of us have gone through before. So we're grasping for past histories. Is this 1973-4, um, which was the Arab oil embargo, where the US had under had, um, underinvested in the oil infrastructure, the Arab oil embargo came, oil price went up, 
What happened then actually was the economy collapsed. Inflation went up and then inflation came straight back down and the economy came back down. Now, that's kind of what I think is happening now. It also could be the 1940s and 50s all over again, where you had massive fiscal stimulus, inflation spiked after World War II because there wasn't enough supply, it settled down, and what you got was a period of extended growth, inflation was okay, uh, and bond yields remained low, and equity returns were really good. Most people are expecting something much more dramatic, which is that inflation stays much higher. I don't know what that means, whether they're talking about 3%, 4%, or, you know, I would say, I would suggest that, that CPI stays between the 2 and 3% kind of, you know, 1% and 3% area. So in that, maybe bond yields trade sideways, but I don't see they breaking out from 3%, which would be a new high, cycle high that we've not seen before, because that's not happened in 35 years. So we'll wait and see. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big picture change. I mean, you know, the, the, the Russian situation is like the Arab oil embargo. So we've seen that before. But then this massive shift to ESG, which is a huge kind of global stimulus where the ECB needs to retool that, the Europe needs to retool its entire economy. But we've also never had that with the largest amount of aging population of all recorded history and the largest debt load. So who the hell knows? Coming out of a pandemic where we Coming broke all the supply chains, you know, it's like, and and that is, I mean, this is why it's, it's it's an incredibly important time to be hearing from these people in the macro world and and to really refocus. I mean, for a long time, you know, people were kind of moving along on the same thesis. And now it does feel like there's this major shift going on. We have so many good questions coming in. Keep them coming. I am going to get to them. I just want to flag one thing. You mentioned it, uh, the fiscal equation. And, and this was something, Gerard, you talked to about, Gerard, and I thought it was so interesting that, you know, are we in a different fiscal situation, especially post-pandemic? I mean, did the pandemic create this situation for the first time? We saw a lot of action on the fiscal front. It wasn't just monetary policy. It was government stepping in fiscally in a way that they hadn't before. Was that a moment in time? Does that stay? Have we really seen a change? I think we have. I think if you assume that and again, we don't know this even. Let's assume monetary policy basically oscillates around zero globally. Well, then the only tool left really is fiscal stimulus and using the central bank balance sheet in times of stress to bolster it. So we saw that the Rubicon got crossed with direct transfer payments during COVID. Everybody around the world did it. And now they've used it once and it worked, they'll do it again. So Europe's already saying, you know what, we have to transition away from reliance on other nations and on fossil fuels. So we understand that this is going to create higher prices. And the only way of dealing with it is to give households money to offset it, as opposed to even just cutting taxes. Spain is doing the same for industry, because Spain is very, um, is very reliant on the oil price. It, 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 uh, they have variable funding, uh, variable oil prices for their utilities. So the utility prices go up 50 percent, et cetera. So they already start subsidizing companies. So I think that becomes the norm. If, if they're saying they're treating it like a war footing, which is like, for the greater good, we have to do this thing. And if we're going to do this thing, we will help you offset it. What does that mean? I mean, that to me sounds like the euro is going to parity and below to the dollar because that's ongoing, endless stimulus. But we're seeing the same in the US, California. They said we're going to give $400 per household. No, $800 per household. And then we've seen like 10 other states make announcements around stimulus. And obviously, the Democrats will use it as an ability to try and um, get a stronger footing for the midterms. We're seeing that. So yeah, I mean, it, it's there, and it's happening, and it's real, and it's going to last a long time. And ongoing, the, once the economy slows down, there'll be more stimulus. And this is this whole kind of debasement of currency that goes on, and then the endless handouts, the endless debt. Where does it get to? It, it gets to everything ending up in the central bank balance sheet, which is the other big story, probably the biggest story that's actually happening right now, and that Western has been talking us through. Is yes. Japan, right? They're doing yield curve control, which I've talked about for a long time, and they've been doing on and off for quite a few years now. But they're in the teeth of it now, because everyone's trying to sell bonds, because there's inflation in Japan. And the BOJ, who already owns 60% of the entire bond market or whatever it is, are buying. And what it does is lowers their currency. 
that trade-off is always there. And so the Japanese, which is the largest savings pool on earth, it then goes to the US bond market and stops bond yields going up in the US, or it goes into US stocks. There's, there's this whole world that's going on, and it's all around this issue of too much debt, interest rates can't rise enough, you still need to stimulate too many, too, too many old people in the workforce. It's, this, it's a really big macro picture. It is, but the, and then shocks on top of it, though, now to sort of sift through. So then through. you don't know what the underlying trend is, right. right? So you get this massive two month recession, massive rebound. So we don't know what the trend of any of this is. We don't know what the actual trend of inflation is. What is structure, sh structural? What is just driven by the parts of this supply chain disruption? How much is the relocating of supply chains back to the US, back to Europe, actually affecting prices? And the answer is, and has to be, we don't know. So anybody to say definitely everything has changed or, or me saying definitely it's sticking with my framework, they're lying. We don't know. Yeah, which is why it's so important to sort of really dig in and hear all these different points of view. And, and, and you know, I think we're all listening to these conversations and saying, yes, I agree with that. I see that. Not sure about that. I mean, that, that, it's really critical. And if you don't get these right, this is going to affect all of the investments. Well, Let's get to a question from Andrew Bayless. Well, hold on one sec, Maggie. The hard question is here is when I ask everybody, OK, how do you allocate money here? And uh, that's... Where, well, what do you do? Short the bond market? Well, it's already pricing in seven and a half yeah. hikes. Do you want to buy commodities here? No, because it's priced in a lot. What do you want to do with the equity market? It already went down 30% and then rebound. It's really difficult to know what to do. And seasoned professionals are going, you know, I don't really know. Gold yeah. didn't do anything. It was supposed to be the great recession, great inflation thing. Well, that failed. It's been fascinating. Cryptocurrencies are still trading, well, at least Bitcoin still seem to be trading as a risk asset. Yeah. So what? So what? So the only sense I can make of it is NASDAQ and crypto bottomed roughly similar times. That's because they're expecting slower growth. And so that for now seems like a good allocation. The dollar seems that it should go higher, but it's really hard to allocate assets in this. Can you remember, Raul, another time? Because I've heard you say, I don't know what the trade is. And and people being honest are, are saying that. Or I'm in cash because I don't know. I, I'm, the, you know I'm just not sure yet. Even if I think I've got a thesis, I'm not sure if the timing's right. Can you remember another time when, when it felt like that? There were times when macro doesn't matter. There's like 2003. 13, 14, 50, it was boring as hell. And then you don't really know what the trade is because it's just owning equities and it's just, there's nothing. And then there's trades like this when everything in macro is moving. No, I've, I can't remember a time, you know, yes, my, what I've done is obviously crypto and I, I um, put out trade recommendation in Global Macro Investor based around my exponential age tech themes because I don't believe the story that inflation is exploding further and rates will go higher. So, I think the economy slows down and those things do well. But no, I, this is difficult. This is a really, really, really difficult market. Yeah, I, I can't remember either. And I think I think part of it is because we may be undergoing these shifts, but then we've had these, I mean, war in the middle of Europe. I mean, who could have possibly seen that? You know, you've had these extraordinary events happen on top of it, and that's really, really made it so difficult. Okay, let's get to a question from Andrew. When do you see the two- or three-year Treasury rate peaking and at what level? Trying to buy some interest income for granny. Thanks for all you do. Um, I'm going to use the two-year. I'm now looking at my Bloomberg, and I'll give you my answer in a sec. I think generally rates top out somewhere, you know, below 3%. So take 3%, that was the top of the last cycle. If it goes through that, something has changed. Same with the 10-year, same with everything. So, but there's a lot priced in here. This is the fastest rate of increase in rates in all, in all history in terms of percentage terms. Now, we're coming from low numbers, so it looks crazy high. But my God, we price this in fast. This is like yeah. 1994's bond collapse. And that's the other thing. Things are happening at, you know, the speed of change and the the degree of moves we're seeing also um, is, is, I think, adding to this, you know, we feeling. We had a 7 
standard deviation event in dollar yen last week. I mean, or this week. I mean, these things, you, these, these are huge moves. And yet we still don't know what it means. So we're kind of looking at the train crash and we don't know what it's all about. Yes, which is horrified faces trying to, trying right. to figure it out. <laughs> um, Gary R. from The Exchange asks, households have added 64.7% debt since 12, 2010. How sensitive is consumer spending to increase debt service costs? And what are the most risk, uh, most at-risk sectors or assets that no one's recognizing? See, household debt service costs are pretty low because interest rates have been very low. It depends when they refinance and where they refinanced. Um, so I don't know, but it's like this fixed cost that sits over you. So if your real income has gone down, then you don't have as much money to spend. And we've seen discretionary spending kind of falling apart in many places. I know uh, restaurants have seen a, a big slowdown now already. In terms of the debt, why worry about the debt? The Federal Reserve will never allow any of this to go bust. I mean. It's a sad truth. You know, they've bought corporate bonds in the past. They've underwritten households with government checks in the past. They obviously um, um, buy the bond market. So what's going to go wrong? This is the crazy situation we're in, is you debase the currency and never allow the debtors to go bust. So you're, you penalize everybody because everybody took on too much debt. It's crazy. Yeah. Um and again, we always we always go back to Japan to different different kinds of debt, but um, you know they've never Nobody let the banking bust. sector go right. They've never let any of it fail, and you know. Nobody went bust. Yeah. Nobody went bust. Yeah, um, which is why a lot of people think we're all headed there. Um, although now we see a little bit of a divergence. So we have Johnny K asking uh, from the RV site, what factors would lead you to change your thesis on the exponential age? On the exponential age of the rise of technology, zero. I mean, nothing, nothing will stop that unless we go back to the dark ages because we've had a nuclear war. But, you know, the rise of technology in the exponential age is the all of these technologies all coming together all at the same time. Now, if those things get adopted on this exponential trend, which is a logarithmic curve, then what you find is that even if you wait for a couple of years, that correction catches up with the log trend. So things become undervalued really fast. People don't really understand that. These are not cyclical plays like commodities that go up and down in big waves. These things just go up because you've got technological adoption. So nothing stops that. What we did see was a re-rating of the markets of the valuation of those businesses. So some of Kathy Wood's more um, um, further out growth bets fell 75% but they've already fallen 75%. So I've been buying this stuff because I've got a basket of, of all of these things and it hit a two standard deviations oversold over its last 10 year trend. It's like, well, it never goes further than this really, unless for well, some reason technology is gonna go into reverse. Not gonna happen. It hasn't happened yet through human history. So, so you, you just, are buying, I know you've been stalking them, looking at them and you weren't sure if it was the right time. Started, You're sort of started. waiting to be started. Yeah. Now, I don't, everyone's gonna go, but what about crypto? I'm like. I advise a lot of different people on a lot of different things, and not everybody has 100% of their wealth in crypto. I do. I think it's a very, I think technology is a great bet. Does it outperform crypto, which is part of the exponential thesis? No. But some people don't like crypto. Some people run an equity portfolio. Other people run all sorts of different things. So just so people are clear. Yeah. We do have uh, a specific question um, since you brought it up from Angela on the exchange. This is very specific. So um, the European Parliament yesterday passed legislation such that users receiving cryptocurrency would need to be identified, transactions from self-hosted, non-custodial wallets, exchanges made to report. Um, can you comment? I mean, this is, you know, this is the regulation issue around crypto digital assets that, you know, it continues to be front and center. Any thoughts on that? Um, to me, as expected in Europe, I knew that they wanted to do this on wallets. It's yet again, Europe making bad decisions because they love regulation more than they love entrepreneurship. And so, you know, somebody pointed, pointed out, look at the largest tech company in Europe. It's SAP. SAP is a company that 
was like a huge tech company in the late 90s. They've not developed anything because the regulatory framework is so bad. GDPR was really hard. I understand what they're trying to do, but they're creating a state that doesn't allow for innovation. And here we go, again, making it more and more difficult. Sure, I mean, do I care about KYC in my wallet? Uh, no, I don't. But it's just at the margin, just doesn't help Europe. Yeah. Do you think, you know, I think there was there there was a thought that the U.S. was going down the same road, but the whole situation with this now has been interesting now that uh, national security is at the forefront again. Um, you know, there, there are concerns and conversations about China and, you know, what this means. We have a question from Rahim on the exchange. I'll shorten it because it's quite long, but um, do you think the chess mate move would be for the U.S. and democratic nations to transition to Bitcoin along with the U.S. dollar as a kind of counter to the possibility that China and maybe some others, you know, look at the, what's happened with the dollar and, and accelerate their plans for digital currencies? No, I mean, we, we know the world's bifurcating. That's been on the cards for a long time. It's accelerating a bit now. It'll slow down for a period of time. Um, and the U.S. dollar is the most powerful thing the U.S. has, aside from its military. Why the hell would it give it up? I mean, it's zero chance. Why would you give it up to Bitcoin? It's just not going to happen. Does Bitcoin continue to gain adoption? Yes, but it's not going to gain adoption from the US. Um, and we're going to transition to Bitcoin. That's a, that's just a, it's, no, it's a false narrative. Do you think they'll be, they'll, they'll uh, maybe change their stance on regulation if the conversation around it moves away from consumer protection and more to national security, which seems to have been gaining some traction right now? Um, again, I, I don't see how that helps national security, Bitcoin. I can understand why it helps sovereign uh, individual security, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, the seizing of assets. I mean, you know, what happened? These Russian oligarchs, they've taken all of their assets without due process. This is not good. Yeah. This is not good. Normally, in Western democratic nations, you would be taking them to court. You would be prosecuting them under certain things. But we're making everybody guilty until proven innocent. And what is the due process to get the assets back? I, I, you know, that scares people. It scares people a lot. The scares people what happened in Canada. You know, these things are an abuse of power. And again, they might be right. The the, the 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 truckers in Canada might have been in the wrong. They were really disrupting people in downtown. You know, not saying the oligarchs are good people, but Western democratic nations have a rule of law. So anyway, so yeah. for individuals, it makes sense because you self sovereignty over your own money is actually seems like it's becoming a more important issue. It certainly does. Mar two questions from uh, on this issue, both from Johnny and from Mark on the RV site. Um, can you comment? Um, around the yen. We mentioned uh, that Weston has been all over this. We covered it uh, yesterday in the daily briefing, or uh, Wednesday, I guess it was, when I was on. We had we had him on to do a whole thing. It was a story that not a lot of people were paying attention to. Um, what, what's your thought? I think I saw, we saw you posting about something big's going on in, in Forex, you know, try, trying to work out what it means. What are your thoughts about what's happening? Dollar yen is breaking out of a 20-year basing pattern. It had been a very non-volatile currency. And this is the largest savings nation in the world with the highest debts in the world and the oldest population in the world. And suddenly you get a seven standard deviation move in this currency it's because they're printing more money into an inflationary episode, which is what yield curve control is. And it hasn't confirmed the bigger breakout, which would be 125. But whether that goes through now or goes through in nine months' time, whatever, there's something going on, and the same is going on with the euro, the 30-year trend in the euro. I understand the euro wasn't around 30 years ago. Bloomberg and many others extrapolate it back with the basket. That whole uh, trend is around 110, which is why we've been fighting with that level. If, if it breaks there, I mean, the euro can go to 80 cents. So there's something about these highly indebted nation with zero interest rates that can't raise interest rates and seeing inflation that is causing the currencies to collapse. Um, a strong dollar is not good for the world. It's a wrecking ball as well, because it blows up emerging markets. What happens to the RMB? I don't know. You know, 
does the Japanese money pile into the European and US bond market because the currency is weak? Probably. Does that stop yields rising in the US? Possibly. You know, these are really big things, and it's not clear yet, which is why I say, and I said in the tweet, and again, like you hear me say this a lot, I don't know, but just watch it, because these kind of things blow up things. Yeah, exactly. And this is, and, and when it, certainly when it comes to the Bank of Japan, as we were talking about with Weston, this is something people weren't watching, right? Because they've been following the same policy forever and ever and ever. And it was sort of like, you didn't have to keep your eye on that. And with everything else that was going on, this is where that, that comes from. You know, when you see an area that people weren't paying close enough attention to, something major happens. And then the ripple effects from that. I mean, yeah, we're talking about the Bank of Japan's tentacles are everywhere. So, I mean, what is going, what appears to be going on is the BOJ forever have been trying to generate inflation. And now because of the supply chain issue and what's happening with Russia, they're going to meet their inflation target, right? And nobody knows what to do. Is this, and this is the argument all the economists are having, is this structural inflation coming or is this a cyclical phenomena? And nobody knows what to do. So the BOJ has to sit there and buy all the bonds and just hope that it figures itself out. Because the other problem is, is if, if they realize it's structural, they're going to have to move yield curve control away from 25 basis points and put it to 100 basis points. That's a complete implosion of Japan as well. So, I mean, yeah, these, these are big, big, big macro things. Uh, we have a question from Hef. A little, a bit of a departure. Are you still bullish on carbon credits, KRBN? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Europe is made it doubly clear and double down on that, but again, that it is transitioning to green energy and they will pay the price in terms of, you know, there's a huge amount of natural resources that will be required. Arguably, there aren't enough. So there's going to be price wars over this stuff. And the ECB have basically said, we have to work together with the government and make this happen and will help people out with the cost differences. And the carbon thing is, is a core part of their strategy, and it's been working. I know a lot of people question that, right? When we saw what, what's happening with oil and, you know, that it, it completely erased the ESG narrative, because now we could see that the world's relying on it. But, uh, but, yeah, but, but we're you... not talking about today. We're talking about yeah. our tomorrows. Now, we've got to get from here to there. And what everyone's realizing is from here to there is a tough journey because we don't have the resources and all the lithium and stuff that we need. We don't have the supply chains to do it. So we need to figure it out. Now, is that nuclear power? But that takes 10 years to build a power station. So this is the structural inflation argument, but it depends where that inflation is. We had a commodity super cycle uh, whilst China was coming into the global economy after 2008. We had a well, before, sorry, after 2000, we had a commodity super cycle. We didn't have high inflation. So it just depends. It's nothing is written here. Yeah. And so many people, you know, if you talk to energy companies, they, they've all along known that it wasn't a binary choice, either fossil fuels or renewables, green energy, and that there would be a transition. And, you know, all of these conversations are are boring and long term and capital intensive, but they've been happening. The market seemed to be more, you know, if it's one, it's the other and another. In fact, we have a, a question about um, what is the long tail of fossil fuels? How long will crude and natural gas play a significant role? Is it realistic to think our energy will come from renewables by 2050? That's from um, Ross on the RV site. The answer is, again, I don't know. Um, we're going to try and get there, and we will go down that journey, and we will see how far we get. My guess is technology it continues to accelerate, and it makes what seems impossible today possible tomorrow. And I just, I've just pulled up the chart of CPI. I just want people to think about this. So in the period of just after 2000 recession, China came full into the global economy after the WTO agreement. This was an entrance of 1.2 billion people who were building roads, cities, bridges, airports, tunnels, uh, everything. It was the largest consumption of technology, of, of commodities the world had ever seen. It was a huge commodity bull market. The average rate of inflation, 
from 2000 to 2008 was 3%. If that's what we're fearing, and while everybody's screaming about inflation has changed, if it's 3% and bond yields are at today, uh, call them 250, so we got negative half a percent um, real yields in a very indebted world, that doesn't sound too crazy to me. So it, again, there's so much uncertainty. People extract, extrapolate, go dot, 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 supply chain, 1970s, rates are going up to 10%. You know, And then you look back and go, OK, we had a macro shock that happened in early 2000. It was a massive shock, the biggest shock I, I've ever lived through. Um, bigger than what's happening now, and inflation averaged at 3%, maybe just a little bit less. We have a great question from Johnny. What are your major takeaways from the Raul the Journeyman series? That's such a good question because those conversations have been so interesting. The biggest takeaway right now is all of my friends have changed their minds. And I really respect these people. So I'm not like, oh, you know, it's just the you know, usual old inflationists who want to buy gold answer to every question. You know, these are people are very, very thoughtful and I really respect have changed my, their view. Some are, some haven't, but a lot of them have. So uh, that's the takeaway. And all of them are still open to the idea that we don't know. Everyone's saying, I think the balance of probabilities has changed, but this is the most uncertain time any of us have ever had to work through. So when you when you have those conversations with them, do you go back and kind of retest what you think? Does it Always. does it make you shift a little bit as you're hearing these really compelling arguments of why they've thrown in the towel and and, and they've changed their that's mind? That's all of our job. Yeah. You know, you always have to be reassessing your probabilities on the information that comes to hand. And there's some really powerful arguments and I get them. I don't think the balance of probabilities is yet in favor of that. I still think it's probably 60, 40 in favor of a continuation roughly of the same, but maybe with bond yields peaking at 3% and getting down back down to 1%, you know, that kind of range. But we'll see. And those guys, all of them said, yeah, you could still be right too. But we kind of think it's the other way around. So it's, you know, nobody, virtually nobody is saying it's an 80% chance that it's this scenario and anybody who says that is a snake oil salesman. Yeah. And what I think is so great is the, you know, really detailing the factors to watch, right? You, the factors that change their mind, but it also gives you a roadmap of what what you need to watch as this happens. What do you what do you make of the labor market, Raul? Because I, I mentioned we had the jobs reported strong. There also, I just saw right before we came on a, a headline past that. I think it was in New York. I could be wrong because I didn't look at it in depth, um, where uh a big warehouse, an Amazon warehouse, agreed to unionize. Um, so you, you, you sort of, you know, some people talking about finally labor getting some wage growth, although not keeping up with inflation, finally getting some muscle because labor markets are so tight here in the U.S. But then on the other hand, I'm like, I'm checking myself out of the supermarket more and more, you know, because they can't get anyone to work at the, the grocery rise store, of the which, I, which I'm terrible at, by the way. If you're behind me, I apologize. I completely suck at it um, because I just do something wrong every time. But um, but, but the, what, the, what rise of the, ro the rise of the robots is coming and it's unstoppable. I mean, Amazon has stores that you walk in and walk out and you never even speak to a single human being. There is no way we're going to rebuild factories in the United States without robots. So there are no jobs coming back, apart from maybe the construction workers who do it, and those will get replaced over time by robots too. You know, artificial intelligence replaces people at a higher and higher level up the food chain, um, faster and faster. The employment rate right now, employment lags the economy, always does. So it's always the last shoe to drop, inflation lags the economy. Both of those two are the most lagging of all the indicators. Um, and, in, and once you get an employment rate down to what, 3.6%, you've pretty much followed a recession every time. So there's something there's something we still don't know within all of this, but I do think that there is a temporary period where labor has a chance to get some wage rises back before they get replaced. Yeah. It's, kind of, it's a terrifying world.
It, it it is especially when you look at that and and that 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 is when you're talking about the exponential age I mean, you just have to look around everywhere and you see it happening um and that has well, massive we used to do this we used to do this maggie with five cameramen three producers sound people people with clapper boards right yeah it's now on a zoom this this is hugely deflationary it's hugely and we haven't even started yeah. And when you're looking at when you're looking at those things, some things I think have more weight than others. And when you're looking at that, that that certainly has to be one of them. So, I mean, I did I just um, as an amusing anecdote, I did a um, and we shouldn't speak badly of them, but I did a a Bloomberg interview and it was a panel show. It was hilarious. So we were filming over Zoom, but because it's old television, they couldn't let us do a Zoom. They had to have a host in a studio with these huge panels up. It was really expensive. There must have been 20 people in the studio orchestrating. They were then sending crews to every single person. I had to hire an entire crew and a studio in Cayman. For a, in the end, I, was, I probably spoke for seven minutes. Yeah. It was like... This is insanity. That's the old world. And what we've got to is this world. Yeah. And it gets even easier. So it, it, it just shows how deflationary all of this technology is. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, deflationary, we're talking about macro. The upside is we get to spend a lot more time talking about the topics because somebody who used to live in that world used to be so frustrating that, you know, you have someone like you in the studio, you get seven minutes, you barely get to, you know, um, dig in on, on the important topic. It costs a hundred thousand dollars for that fifteen minute segment. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's more efficient, more informative, but if you, you know look back in what the studio used to be in and think about all of those people who were there versus now you're in front of your computer. Yeah, we got Brian here and Nick's probably here what, as well. We're, Brian and Nick were ten people, it must be said. Exactly. <laughs> They're like rock stars. Uh, and and uh, there are pitfalls to doing it yourself, as they will attest when my mic wasn't working early today, but we won't get into that. So now we know the two things. I'm not a good sound technician, and I'm really bad at bagging my own groceries, but we will persevere. <laughs> um, David is asking, what asset classes are best to be in and what percentage in equities? With the caveat, uh, David, of course, everybody's is di everybody's needs are different. Your risk profile is different when you need the money, your age, all of that, which, uh, you know, we'll just put that disclaimer out there to begin with. But um, I think it's really, what do you do right now? Where well, can you find which safety, side of, maybe? Depends which side of the fence you come from, right? So if you think that growth is slowing and inflation will slow, you want to own equities and you want to own crypto and you're fine. If you think that the secular stagnation and that's not going to change, then you don't want to own equities. But then what do you own? I mean, gold's gone nowhere. So that's normally what the people who believe in secular stagnation began, well, you need to own gold. Well, it hasn't really worked. It's up 5% this year. It's kind of offset equities, I guess, which were down 5% now. But it's not been easy. And commodities, the answer is I don't know. So I'll tell you what I'm doing. And I'm at a personal level, haven't changed anything. I'm still 100% crypto because I think that's the biggest secular trend of all time. Um, on a global macro investor uh, level, uh, I am long dollars. I am starting to buy exponential age equities um, and long crypto and trying to pick the top in the bond market. And I'm still waiting. I had one shot that failed. I'll give it another go. But in terms of a broad allocation, if you've heard me speak through this whole show, the answer is it's not clear. Um, so just don't take too much risk. Um, we're stretching it a little bit because we have you, Raul. Um, but what, what about commodities? Well, the secular commodity theme should work. But if we've got a sort of slowdown, then you've got demand destruction. So in which case, commodities will correct first. And copper has been kind of telling us that it's not gone up. So, you know, I'd rather buy commodities in the down cycle that let's assume we get a recession or something close to it and commodities sell off 50 percent from here. Then you can buy commodities again here. Feels like it's a flip of a coin. Yeah. By the way, to circle back to um, 
we always get I, I, all of the questions today, Raul, are macro. Most of them are oh. macro. We know whatever we have you on. There's a lot of I, I think crypto. it tells the time we're in. Right. There's always a lot of crypto questions. And we had one about regulation. But all of these questions are macro, which is so interesting. Yeah. But, and you can tell macro is interesting because I've got a ton of interviews coming out in Real Vision all the time on macro because it's time to focus. Not that I'm not focused on crypto. As I said, I spend most of my life into that space. But macro is phenomenally interesting. And if you get these things right, once you see through, OK, I understand where this could go, it's very rewarding. It is. And and for those, by the way, you do we, we have a ton on crypto. You have been having a, a huge amount of conversations about macro, but um, so worth checking out if you're trying to understand why so many people are bullish on that space, on the larger digital aspect space. I saw the interview that um, Kevin Kelly did with Greg Eisenberg, and it just blew my mind. Um, how to build a community-focused business, but I thought it was such a it was such great insight on why there's so much enthusiasm and and bullishness. And you could see how I thought they did a great job of bridging the kind of the world most of us live in with that next one that has you and so many other people excited. It was so good. Because and Greg and Kevin uh, know them both well are at the forefront of what most people can't see. We're still talking about Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, and all those, and those will be important. What these guys are talking about is the applications layer, how it goes to the masses. Um, and that is really interesting because it affects businesses like Real Vision. It's going to affect everybody, the music industry, the book publishing industry. And I've been following that narrative in Raoul's Adventures in Crypto because that is the mass adoption phase, and, and it's going to be huge because I'm involved in it and I see it everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I encourage all of you if you haven't if you haven't checked it out, go go to realvision.com and and look at that interview. Um, and it's it's gonna it's really gonna change things for you um, because I'm still thinking about so much of what they said. You and you have no idea the series of eight interviews I've got coming up on Rails Adventures in Crypto. Next week is the longest interview in the history of Real Vision. Probably in my top five favorite interviews I've ever done. Uh, and I won't let you know who You're that not going to tell us what it is. You're just going to drop that teaser. It's unbelievably good. Um, and, and then we're following up with literally eight weeks of the biggest names and the most incredible stories in all of crypto. So anybody who's not hasn't signed up, realvision.com forward slash crypto or realvisioncrypto.com. It's just a bloody email and you get the world's best crypto show every Friday and you'll get an email notification to remind you to watch it. Trust me, there's some epic stuff coming. Yeah, no, it's so good. And it, and and and, it's, and what I loved, it's certainly about um, about many of them, but about that interview that I just mentioned was its accessibility. And I tweeted that too, because they talk about that and talk about inclusion. And it was, you know, you don't have to be an expert to understand it. We had we had a crypto event, someone joked um, when I was in, uh, Maggie must be in the wrong discord. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, I'm catching up. I'm catching up quickly, watch out for me. Um, but no, but it, it, it's really worth, but switching back to macro. Um, so we're gonna be in California. Um, which I'm so excited about in person. It's going to be awesome. But um, what are you most looking forward to? Because we're going to be chewing over all of these things that we just talked about in this last half hour. We're going to be diving in there with a bunch of folks that we have on the platform regularly. What are you most looking forward to? Well, first, it's it's getting that exchange of ideas, just hearing how people are navigating this. Because, you know, all you can try and do is learn from each other, listen, absorb. Does that change my thesis? Am I comfortable with my thesis? What does that mean? So I think there's that. Meeting a whole bunch of real vision visionaries will be fun. And getting together and having a drink with people like Tony Greer and Tommy Thornton and all of the guys is going to be lovely as well. So it's kind of, it's a lovely event. It's a beautiful place in, uh, in, in uh, San Diego. So the whole event should be lovely. I think it'll be great and a lot of great content coming out of it, um, which we're going to be doing the daily briefing there live, which will be fantastic. And for those of you who can't make it to get tickets, we, we still want you to participate and you can get virtual tickets. And we're offering some specials uh, to make sure as many people as possible uh, can participate. So to find yeah, out. I mean, it's so important right now to just get in as much information and an event like this. That's what it's there for. 
Exactly, because people are trying to make, I mean, we heard someone joke about getting some income for granny, but but people very seriously are trying to protect their capital or they're trying to figure out how to navigate. Nobody wants to lose their shirt and it's really hard. We need, we all need help to try to figure out how to protect our money, how to grow our money because we have to, we still have to, you know, save for the future. So I, I also think it's just really critical that we educate ourselves and follow along so we can make decisions. You, you can't, the time, it doesn't seem like the kind of time right now, Raul, where people can just sort of say, I'm going to just put my money there and leave it and, and not pay attention because, you know, it's just going to go up straight. It doesn't feel like we're in that kind of period anymore. No, no. All right, guys, we got to let Raul get to his weekend. But thank you all for joining us. Raul, great to see you. Can't wait to see you next week. And for information on those virtual tickets, go to realvision.com forward slash macro experience, and you can find out everything you need. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take care and good luck out there. Yeah, have a great weekend, Maggie, and to everybody else. Have a good one. Uh -huh.